Welcome back to the Fantasy Hockey Podcast Weekend Preview. And before we get started, we wanted to say thank you to everyone because we hit a million streams. And well, at least on Podbean, which is our new kind of podcast provider thing. You say new. We hit a million. Yeah, so it's new. Since like September 15th of 2018. Yes. So like in a year and so, change, we got to a yeah. million, which is pretty sweet. Which is amazing. My Alexa just turned on. Amazon is listening to me. I think Amazon likes the podcast too. Get out of my house, That's Bezos. <laughs> okay, so let's jump into the 10 takes for the week. I'm going to start with one that, honestly, everyone should have seen coming. But look, I, and I know, I know this is my second month in a row doing this, but Bob is back. Oh, God. Bob is back. Come on. He's back to a 903 on the, sense, on the season. Session. Wow. Since benching... <laughs> Since the benching, he has a 9.53 save percentage and has only allowed 10 goals against in six games played. He's been on a tear. What's kind of crazy, though, is that he's 3-3 three and three in those six games. So, again, now all of a sudden, the goaltending is, is working, but they can't score. So, what the, the hell Panthers is going are voodoo. on? I don't know. The, the Panthers are voodoo. That's that's it. You don't know who they are. So true. Maybe uh, playing Brett Connolly and Frank Vitrano with Barkov is questionable decision-making. But if you could play Bob at every position, I think they'd go 82-0. Although they, they did win. Oh, I don't know about that. They did win that game, though, didn't they? Huberdeau got like four assists with yep. on that they Trocek. Did. And uh, I don't even know who was on the right wing. It wasn't it wasn't Hoffman. I think it was Trocek. And, and it wasn't Dadanov either. So I'm not sure who was playing on the right wing there. A ghost. It doesn't matter. He just assists whoever's nearby, apparently. Okay. My first take is, yes, Christian Dvorak is interesting. Let me Let me start here but we are getting so many questions it would make you think that christian dvorak is like somebody dropped like i don't know roman yossi or something it's very weird the the hype that's that's existing around dvorak who's in a position that we don't know if he's going to keep now um there's a lot of speculation by everybody i guess about what that top line was going to look like once hall got moved over and it made a lot of sense to put it really still makes a lot of sense to keep Dvorak there, not only just because he's a pretty good center and probably the best that the, the uh, Coyotes have, which honestly really isn't saying anything. It's, I wouldn't even say it's not saying much. It's not saying anything. Their center depth is bad. But Dvorak is very, very good at faceoffs. I think he's leading the league for like, if you look at somebody who has more than 200 faceoffs or so, 58% or something like that. He's very good. And you look at some of the other center options. A lot of people said, why isn't Schmaltz center centering them? Schmaltz is the best center. Schmaltz is a career 38% face-off guy. Yikes. I, I don't think he will ever be centering that top line. It's just, why? I mean, as good a center as he is, if he can't win draws, then you're going to wind up with Hall and, and Kessel needing to play back, you know, 62% of the time. You, know, you don't want that. Um, so Dvorak makes the, the, the right, seems like the right call. Uh, Stepan is the, and Soderberg with the, with the two other options of who could be the top center. Soderberg plays a pretty good role as a, you know, a third-ish line center. Um, he's okay at faceoffs. Stepan is probably the other best option as a top-line center, but he's not great at faceoffs either. Uh, so if you're looking for somebody who, to, who, to win the draw and then be a pretty decent center on top of it, it's got to be Dvorak. That said, nothing is set in stone here. Um, if Dvorak struggles, they're not going to hesitate to try somebody else, even if it does wind up being Schmaltz for a while. Um, I'll, I really can't see that being long-term because of face-offs, but whatever. Um, Dvorak actually got an assist pretty much right when we started recording this uh, on a Kessel goal, of course, from Hall as well. Uh, so things are looking good so far, but don't put Dvorak on this like rest-of-season 65-point pace guy that seems to be what he, he's viewed at. I've, at this point, I feel like if I ask somebody if they like Kessel or Dvorak more, I hear Dvorak, which is just weird to me. But... Um, Dvorak is great to pick up if he's a free agent or like a if somebody you could trade a somewhat streaky streamer for or something. But beyond that, temper your expectations. He's still, you know, he's a player that has a bright future. And he's been playing better and better every every year. But I don't think we can expect a ton out of him despite his line mates because we just don't know what's going to happen the rest of the season. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I picked him up uh, for... I ended up dropping Nick Foligno for him in one league. 
uh, which I think is a fine move. Nick Villeneuve is my worst forward, so why not? Um, and I was doing fine in peripherals before him. And then in my other league, I dropped Pierre-Luc Dubois for him, which right now doesn't look so good. <laughs> but but I was benching Pierre-Luc Dubois constantly because I had two centers. I already had uh, Kopi and Barkov. And so I, I found myself benching Pierre-Luc Dubois a lot. If I was going to have to drop Dubois eventually anyways. Um, unfortunately, it had to be right before he scored like 10 million points. So I'm regretting it a little bit, but I, I'll be fine, I think, in the future. I think. Uh, a team that's not fine is the San Jose Sharks. They look awful again after a little bit of a resurgence. According to The Athletic, they have a 7% chance of making the playoffs now, and they don't even own their first-round pick. Mm. Yeah, this could be a sad, sad season for the Sharks. Do you mm. think they turn it around? I want to say yes. There's just so much talent on that team. I get that the goaltending is is an issue, but I don't I don't understand. I just I, that, that's like the full extent of it. I just don't understand. You know, they they made this deal for for Carlson. Everybody's like, this is a cup team now. It's not just not they're not just playoff a playoff team. They're a cup team. They're a contender, and they played pretty well in the playoffs last season. And then one year, you know, you're talking six months later, we're into a new season, and this is what we get. How how? What's going on? <laughs> Their team didn't change that much. I know that Pavelski moved on, but I mean, he was an aging player that had a, a, an unsustainable season last season. So I don't, I don't know. I think both of us included among with a, a lot of other people expect a lot from the Sharks this year, especially their, their younger kind of up and coming players like Timo Meyer and, and Kevin LeBanc and, uh, you know, a, a good power play. And uh, I, what <laughs> what is this what is what is happening yeah i don't know the sharks are a confusing team um i mean really you can point i think almost entirely to goaltending though know, they have the second worst save percentage in the league the people around them are the detroit red wings the los angeles kings the new jersey devils shockingly the nashville predators are 27th in save percentage in the league yeah they've been is, awful they've been really bad yeah. this season for whatever reason yeah yeah, I don't know why or what happened there in the Minnesota Wild. And, of course, the Florida Panthers, who, again, like I said, are on the up because Bob is back. So let's pretend like they December don't of exist Bob. There. Christmas of Bob. Okay. Christmas of Bob. That is what it is. And December's almost over. So really, it's going to be the new year of Bob. Okay. He is. He is. Um, he's what the new year is for. You know how um, in Chinese New Year, you have a specific animal, right? Wherever you're going, with this, I don't want to hear it. Like, I, I'm just so sure of it. My animal of 2019 or 2020, sorry, is going to be Bobrovsky. That, that's what it is. It's Bobrovsky. I, I, didn't want to hear it. I knew it, yep. and yet I had to. You made me. <laughs> but the Sharks have a lot of problems, and honestly, their core C4 is... Kind of, what's weird is their offense is very middle of the pack. Their core C4 right in the middle, or core C4 percentage, their Fenwick right in the middle. Um, scoring chances for, so how many of the scoring opportunities do you control uh, compared to the other team right in the middle? So offensively, they've been just average, but then when you couple that with league worst save percentage, aside from the Detroit Red Wings, who honestly are an AHL team, when you Pretty couple much, that yeah. with that bad of save percentage, that's what brings you down. And so I think you do need to point a lot of it to the save percentage, and and it's hard to play, it's hard to play from behind constantly. And I think that's what's happening to the Sharks here. But there's a lot of issues. I personally don't think they turned around. I, I think it's just too far gone at this point. Um, I, I think if they fix their goaltending, they can fix it. But I think if they cannot fix their goaltending, this is all a lost cause, even offensively. I'm somewhat surprised that they didn't make a move before roster lock, which is on the 19th tonight when we're recording this, um, to address or at least take a, a stab at some maybe goaltender. Because right now their season is, I mean, how you if I were, I don't know, you know, I, I would expect that. With this aging core, you got to take a shot, um, I think. And, well, aging-ish, right? Like Burns aging out. You kind of want to be able to use him while he's good. And uh, I, 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 I don't know. Is there, was there nobody available that they could have taken a shot with? Like throw him in the starter role, see what happens type players? I, I don't know. I mean, do you think I'd be better than Martin Jones? I, maybe, which is sad. <laughs> and for you to say that about me, you know Martin Jones is bad. Oh well, I've got a tie-in with the Sharks for my next take, and that's I get that Burns has been disappointed, especially in the last like however long it's been that he's gone pointless. But 
he's still one of the best defensemen. I get that he hasn't had a point in a billion years, but his ice time actually recently has been ridiculous. Um, he went from playing 19 to 20 minutes a game. Now he's playing like 25 to 28. It's been crazy. Um, and his shots are starting to come back up just because of the additional ice time. I, the, some of the trades that I've seen people offering their burns for is... I get that he was overvalued at the draft. It just it just has to be you know, a thing that you recognize at this point. But he still has a lot of value over replacement-level defensemen. So I don't... Just be careful. Don't sell yourself too short with Burns. If you draft, if you have him, you might you probably draft him really high. So if you're going to trade him for somebody that's like not not a very high ceiling player, then you're just reducing the chances of. It just doesn't seem worth it to me. I'd rather just hang on to Burns and go down with the ship, unless I can trade him for somebody that at least is going to provide me uh, a high ceiling. Um, yeah. I'm the it's, same way. I, I own him in my keeper league and I'm really like not fully even entertaining it. I'm last game of uh, 64% of the power play time was Brent Burns and Eric Carlson together, which quite frankly is better for Brent Burns, no matter what, just because before he was getting what 30% or something, he's mm -hmm. also getting the most time at even strength. Um, and they're controlling shot share while he's on the ice really well. He's playing with Brendan Dillon now. Um, so I, I do like what's happening with Brent Burns. Uh, he seems to be kind of, turning it around at least a little bit he did get a point the other night actually um so i am a little higher on brent burns he also seems to be shooting a little bit more as of late but i i and i get like you said i think i get the frustration but i don't think you can sell him i, I don't think you can get close to his value you're not going to get close to what he should be worth you know or ceiling is worth at least right i, I have him in a dynasty league and i'm I like at this point i'm just like I might as well just roll him until he's dead because <laughs> I'm just going to get goofy uh, trade requests if I even shop him. So I'm rolling him until he's dead. Rolling until he's dead. I like that. Now, another guy uh, that is clearly being rolled until they're dead is Chabot, who is yeah, now. I'm surprised two, he's not already dead. Right? Two games straight now, he's played over 30 minutes. And not just 30 minutes, but obscene amounts of minutes. This last game he played. 34 minutes, so we're recording this on Thursday night. So Thursday night's game, Chabot played 34 minutes. And the game before that, he played a whopping 37 minutes and 50 seconds, which was only 15 seconds away from the all-time high. They didn't play him. Apparently, the coach did say that they would have played him for the 15 seconds if they had known that they were close to the record. Somehow, though, I got to question the uh, competency of the Ottawa um, coaching staff if they don't think that 37 minutes and 50 seconds is anywhere near the all-time high. Um, I Man, I, if this is going to become a thing, Chabot's value increases dramatically. But on top of that, this is just kind of sad because it tells you, it shows just how bad the defense core is for Ottawa. Yeah, they are dealing with a couple of injuries, which I think is part of the reason. When I saw that number, I was like, wow, there must have been injuries on the ice. But apparently, apparently not. They did it again. They did it again. Um, okay, my next take is... I don't know why, but I've seen Grace and Varlamov being dropped. And I... I, 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 and I this was before the, the bad game. Because let's be honest, all things considered, there was, there's been one truly bad Islander game as far as two. getting blown up. Two. Two. Um, Two? What was the other one? How bad was that one? Uh, there was one early in the season. Remember Varlamov? I think it was maybe Varlamov's first game when everyone started freaking out about him. Oh, That's yeah. The other one. But it still wasn't one. an eight-goal against game. No. Grice has had one. Varlamov has had one. Well, they both had one in this last one because yeah. whoever started, I think it was Grice, started, got pulled, and then Varlamov got lit too. But I don't know. I don't understand what the panic is about. We're still looking at two of the leading save percentage and goal against average players that are both I mean, considering they split starts decent for wins. So I'm not, I don't understand why anybody would ever drop either one, at least not with the way things are going. Um, again, I've, I've mentioned how to use these players. You need to back them up with either the other one, which I actually have done in a league. Of course, this this week I grabbed Grice in a, a league that he dropped in. 
And uh, they got lit for eight in that Monday game or whatever, Tuesday game or whatever it was. So that was great. But in general, I think that tandem is among the best in the league. Uh, that or Arizona. Um, but um, beyond that, like it, it, you just need to hit your three start minimum in most leagues because most leagues are, are averages leagues. And these guys, okay, they don't they're not going to get you a ton of wins just from a volume perspective. But if you back them up with a with a starter that gets majority starts. Um, they make an excellent supplementary piece because they're going to get you great um, saves and goal against average with a decent chance of getting wins when they do start. And then your starting goaltender, hopefully if he's decent, because if you got an Islander goaltender, you got him late. So I, I just, I don't quite understand what this recent, and this might be totally anecdotal. I don't know if this is going on more across the other leagues, but I've seen it in three or four of the leagues I'm in. Grice or Volomov get dropped. I just, I'm still just baffled by it. Yeah, I don't get it. It reminds me a lot of uh, Varley at the beginning of the year. And we were like, why is he uh, Why is he getting dropped so much? And yeah, then, he had that well, one bad game. And then, I don't know, his like, ranking or whatever dropped like a million points. And it's like, let's, let's, let's take a step back before he makes some rash decisions over one game. Yep. Uh, my next one here actually is another goaltender. I, I want to talk about the Nashville split. We already kind of briefly mentioned that they are terrible from a save percentage perspective this year. Um, and I think that we're going to start to see more of a split. So at the beginning of the year, there was a lot of talk about how they were going to want to do a split between Saros and Pecorine going down the stretch. And uh, we haven't seen that materialize largely because both of them have sucked. And so in one vein, you see Saros run with it for a little bit. And then you'll see uh, Rene run with it for a little bit. And then neither of them run with it. And they actually go no goalie because that's better. And it's just a complete mess. But I think that going forward here, we're probably going to see more of a split. I think it could look very similar to the Rask lock split uh, that we see in Boston. Now, that's not exactly a good thing. It's obviously not good for Rene owners. Um, and I don't think you should be rushing to grab Saros either. Now, if you're in a saves league, you're kind of in trouble with Pecorine because uh, I don't think he's going to be getting the starts. Now, there is a chance for him to get starts because if he starts to get hot and Staros remains, well, I don't know, whatever the Nashville Predators are doing this year on the fence. Did you just then... call him Staros? No, Saros. But I called him Saros. No. That's a that's a great nickname if he actually starts playing well. Staros. I'm going to call Staros. him that's... You know what? I don't know if I did say it. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. But because you said it was a positive thing, maybe I did say it. If you, but if you either, had admitted to it, I would have, I would have chastised you. <laughs> I know. That's why. It's because I said I whatever. Uh, but I wouldn't rush to grab Saros. And if you're in a saves league, I would maybe see what you can get for Rene. But I'd need to get a starting goaltender back. Um, Bob may be an interesting target. But I've also seen a lot of Rene owners get targeted with Bob and try to get kind of fleece. So I think one example I saw was Bob... For Rene and JT Miller in a league that counts faceoff wins, and they did not have saves. And in that situation, I actually said to hold JT Miller and Rene because Rene has the upside in an averages league because I, I just don't think Nashville is this bad. And JT Miller still holds a lot of value, tons of value, not enough for Bob. So in a, in an averages league, I wouldn't be rushing to do any kind of package to upgrade your goaltender. I would actually probably rather play the wire if he really comes down to it. It's still too early for that. Uh, but I wouldn't be, you know, drastically packaging something up. If you're in a saves league, then maybe. Maybe, yeah, I'd start to think about, okay, what can I get? Or can I handcuff with Saros and just lose every week? Um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> kind of depends on what you want to do. Uh, but I wouldn't be doing anything brash with Rene, and I wouldn't be rushing to pick up uh, UC Saros. Staros. Yeah. Shea Theodore's reverse jinx worked, huh? Yeah, it did. We've had a few reverse jinx this year. We used to kill players with injuries. Yeah. Now we just reverse jinx. It's kind of yeah. a good, good pivot. So he's what? Uh, well, they're in the middle of a game right now, but he's got a goal in five assists in his last three games or something. I'll take it. I didn't quite drop him. I thought about it. Did call him sustainably low, although I couldn't understand why. And now I'm looking at the other player that I've been calling sustainably low that I don't understand why, and that's Matt Dumba. There's a little bit of a difference between the two, to be honest, because Dumba hasn't been shooting, and that's a very easy way to not get points. But he's still in a lot of good positioning and a lot of positive deployment, and a lot of the numbers on him don't make sense. So let's hope that Wednesday's call on Dumba reverses the trend for him as well, and we can 
all be happy again, at least to some extent. <laughs> I think we need to do an episode in the new year, perhaps, of uh, what we'd like. Let, let, we can do like a reverse jinx episode where we just kind of talk about all the things we'd like to happen to the players and uh, reverse jinx them. Although I don't know if that's how reverse jinx works. No, I wouldn't. We'd have to tell them about how bad they are and then yeah, they get better. right. Okay, okay. So I guess we can just talk. Okay, you know what? Let's scrap that. Let's go to my next take. That's a, that's a terrible terrible anecdote uh so for my last take here uh, i want to talk actually kind of in the same idea as brent burns as john klingberg be patient i know brandon has been just killing you with the sustainably low calls and i think you even called him a drop candidate or something i didn't but... call him a drop candidate i said he's sustainably okay. low while he's not on top power play but he is okay now. well he's back to top power play so be patient uh he had two assists tonight uh, so I, I wrote this before he got his two assists, my script, but I still hold that he is. You, you need to be patient with John Klingberg. Now, there is a caveat with John Klingberg in that the new coach is defensively oriented. And so from a whole team perspective, there might be less goals to go around in general if we see Dallas become more of, say, an Arizona or a New York Islander team, uh, which is very possible, right? Because they have the goaltending to do that. And they have some pretty good defenders, so they could go that route and start to try to play the New York Islander and Arizona Coyote way. But I, I, it's too early to tell. I, I can't say yes or no to that, but it's something to note, right? If they want to be an offensive team, then obviously there's a lot more points to get in on. If they want to be a defensive team, there's a lot fewer points to get in on, and Klingberg mostly gets his points through assists. So he's very dependent on the style that they're going to play. Um, so you may need to calibrate what you're thinking of him. He might not be a 60 point D man, but I think he's still worth it. Right. I agree. I, I have Klingberg. I didn't drop him in any of my leagues, but he was very annoying when high school was taking over top power play, but I did the, advise for what it's worth people not to let him go. Um, I mean the, the problem with, um, with Klingberg this season, especially has been that his ceiling is really high but his floor is also very low. Uh, he's a very dangerous player to own because sometimes he can go off, and then when he's invisible, he is truly, truly invisible. Mm -hmm. Which is kind I of the definition of invisible, I guess. I don't think you can be invisible or truly, truly invisible, but whatever. No, you get be like point. translucent or something. I guess. But uh, Okay, my last take. Pavel Francouz. Oh, my God. I knew it. I was going to put him down on one of my takes. I wrote it down, and I thought, nope. Brandon is 100% going to talk about this. He has Go been talk about it. Very good. Not to yeah, my he, surprise, if I'll be he honest. Has, he has been. I did call him as a starter for some team next season. We'll see how that goes. But currently, he is 10 2 and 1 with a 934 save percentage and a 2.16 goal against average. Doesn't get a lot better than that. Somebody's going to tweet, but Tristan Jari. I, I get it. Or Jerry. We, we got this right. I remember we knew this before, and then we got corrected on it, and then we started saying it the other way, and, and yeah, Jerry. Anyway, I, I like Franz Suze a lot more than I like Jerry, for whatever that's worth. But Do you? I mean, I do as an actual goaltender. I don't know if I do in his current situation because he's a backup, but right. um, I just mean that's like... That's my take, too. If, you put, if I put them against each other, let's say they had the same team in front of them, but they were going against each other, I would I would take Franz Suze, but... Um, yeah, I'm I'm digging it. I love having him in my dynasty league. Um, and I really do think he's going to be somebody that we should be paying attention to draft season next season if he gets picked up by a team that could use him like the Sharks. The Sharks don't need goaltending. <laughs> 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 but Colorado Avalanche have the sixth best safe percentage in the league. So they're tied for fifth with the St. Louis Blues. So look, honestly, handcuffing both of them is not a bad idea. If you own Grubauer... Picking up Francis is not a terrible idea. Nope. Like, honestly, so I have Grubauer and Markstrom. I've thought about the idea of potentially trading Markstrom and trying to handcuff with Francis, and that would give me my minimums every week. Uh, but, alas, I've not done that because goaltenders are hard as hell to trade, especially when you have an underrated one like Markstrom. Yep. Okay, so let's move into the weekend pickup suggestions and start with the schedule preview. So the teams with good matchups are going to be Arizona, who plays Detroit. Toronto has a ridiculously easy schedule in the New York Rangers and Detroit. By the way, the New York Rangers, while an easy team to play, 
shockingly have the 11th best save percentage in the league. So they're uh, easy that's to play. Weird. Yeah, it's very, very weird. They just, they give up so many goals a game. It's insane. The Toronto Maple Leafs are the fourth highest team of total goals per game. So how high scoring is a game? The New York Rangers are fifth. And so this should be a high scoring game. So it's a good matchup for Toronto, in my opinion, and for the New York Rangers who play off nights. So the teams with bad matchups are going to be Florida, who plays Dallas and Carolina. Tough matchups. Maybe winnable, but from a fantasy perspective, I think those are going to be tough. Edmonton plays Pittsburgh and Montreal, two of the best teams in the league. Not going to be easy there. Detroit plays Toronto and Arizona. And well, like we said, Detroit is an AHL team. So I don't even know why they're on this list. San Jose, St. Louis, and the Vegas Golden Knights. Very tough matchups, especially uh, Vegas is a divisional game. St. Louis is playing fantastic. And San Jose can't get a stop. Teams that play both off days are going to be the New York Rangers and the Dallas Stars. Two of maybe the most boring teams to have to pick up from, unfortunately. But there's some some options uh my first one is brendan lemieux left wing 11 percent owned on the new york rangers he gives you bangos and if you have a pims league uh there's a good chance that he gets your pims at some point his deployment isn't that good anymore so really all you're looking at is peripherals with him well he's been playing with um panarin just not on power play so you might be able to get a, a sister goal here or there but yeah maybe i mean they, they've been he hasn't been getting in on anything with Panarin recently, which he was, and now he's not. So maybe that turns around this weekend. But he's a good gamble, especially in deeper leagues. Yeah, uh, I actually put Pavel Buchnevich in here, right wing, eleven percent. We picked him up in our cupful league. He's just been vo- doing volume shooting, which is good enough. I mean, even if he doesn't get a point, um, I'll take the peripherals that he's putting up at the moment. But again, this is it's bottom of the barrel pickings here. There's nothing. There's no easy wins this weekend. Um, oh, but there is. Oh, here we go. Well, it's not for off nights. Well, there's one off night, but Zach Hyman, center left wing, 12% owned. Not a long-term option. But uh, if you have room, he's worth it for the ridiculously easy schedule Toronto has this weekend. Mm. And he's playing 17 to 21 minutes a game, big range. But I, I like him. I like him a lot this weekend if you can get him. He's probably the best option on Toronto right now because everyone else is highly owned. And with Andreas Janssen out, uh, there's not really many options. There's Ilya Mishiev, of course, but Mishiev is kind of a, I don't know, genie in a bottle sort of thing. He has two goals and he has two goals in two games now, or two goals in his last two games. That's the right phrasing there. Um, but still, I, I would much rather gamble on a guy like Zach Hyman. So if you have room, but for whatever reason, I, I, don't, I really don't think many people are going to have room on Saturday. Uh, but if anything, you can pick him up on Friday and get at least one off night. I hate Hyman. Me too, but he's good for this weekend. I knew it would make you mad. So well, part let, of let that reason this, is why I suggested him. I feel like him, I just but... angered a lot of Leafs fans, but he's not. He's one of the most overhyped fantasy players. Um, for some reason, everybody thinks because of his deployment, he's going to get a million points. He just doesn't play that style. He's not a point guy. So, I mean, he might be good for the if they shell out, which they could for sure. Um, but I don't know why every time he comes back from an injury, people think he's going to light it up. He did, never has. He never has in his career. Yep. Agreed. But, I mean, this weekend, I'm, I'm going to suggest him. So, there's that. Well, I'm going to suggest Rope, uh, Rupe Hints. Oh, I hate this, too. Center left wing, 36%. Top power play. Whatever. Off nights are hard. He sucks. He doesn't suck. You know he doesn't suck. He sucks. But he sucks. I don't he know sucks this year for make... fantasy. Eh. I like he that he's sucks. top power play. I'll take that. He sucks. Hyman's not top power play. I bet you that Hintz gets more points than Hyman this week. I'll, yeah. I would take that bet, absolutely. Ooh. I'll take that bet, absolutely. Ooh. We'll, we'll figure out what, what the bet, what the uh, actual bet is offline. Yeah, we're kind but of far away from each other. absolutely do it. Yeah, we are. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll have to figure something out. Uh, my last one is left wing, 46% owned Chris Kreider. Uh, got a goal last game, played 19 minutes again. Um, seems to have not been demoted, which is nice. Who knows? He can get demoted at any minute, though, because David Quinn can't make up his mind. So I don't know what exactly is going to happen with Chris Kreider, where he's going to play. But of all the Rangers that are out there, he's probably my favorite one to pick up with the most point upside, um, top power play. Also get you some peripherals. Uh, yeah, he's good. I didn't mark him down, but D'Angelo is still 47% owned, too. So. Yeah. An option. Yeah. I've got two goalies here to round things out. I've got Ilya Samsonov, 18% playing Friday at the Devils. Pretty good matchup. 
And then we've got uh, Ryan Miller playing on Sunday against um, who are they playing against? Against the Rangers. Uh, so I mean, it, it's actually there aren't a lot of good. Typically Sunday you'll find decent backup options. There's not a whole lot of back to backs going on for teams. There's the Sharks who what are you gonna do? Take Aaron Dell tired against the Knights? Like come on. Um, then there's the Red Wings. We can just stop there. And then the last one is the Ducks. So really, if you're in a desperation mode and you're walking into Sunday, the only option is Ryan Miller, I think. Um, unless some surprise backup plays for some reason, which could happen, I guess. He, there's It's it's very possible that Georgiev or whatever plays against Anaheim for that game. So that might be a better option, but I can't predict that. I can just pretty much assume that uh, it'll be Miller net against against the Rangers. So at 4%, Pro he's going to be available anyway. Yeah, probably. Now, next week is a holiday week, and so the schedule is going to be a little bit different. We will be releasing Monday and Tuesday special episodes. We're going to go over every single team in the league and preview what we think, in a, think of them. Wow, what a great uh, what a great sell here. Uh, we're going to tell you what we yes, think of good. them. Words are very good. <laughs> yeah, we words say, are good. We're going to say all the good words about all the teams <laughs> in the hockey leagues. I, I'm, I don't know about you. I'm going to say all the bad team, all the bad words about uh, the Detroit Red Wings. But I next think, don't, week, I'm curious. I now that you mentioned, I don't even remember how we structured this last season. I think we. I don't either. Um, but here's what's going to happen: We're going to go over every single team in the league and tell you what we think of them for the, this coming season. And we're going to go player by player too. Not every single player. We're going to talk about fantasy relevant players. Also dissect the team overall and what we think. We'll talk about goaltenders. We'll talk about surprises. forwards, defensemen. All the, the, we'll talk about surprises of, that was of the, the past season did. so far. Um, and then we're also going to give you previews for what's coming. And we're going to do it by conference. So Monday and Tuesday, there will be special episodes coming out. Um, probably like an hour or two long each. Who knows? Something like that. Um, you can catch those on the podcast or on YouTube. Uh, and then also we'll be doing like a midweek preview that will come out on Wednesday or Thursday since there's no games Tuesday through Thursday. So there'll be a little bit of a, like a midweek preview. So we'll skip the normal week preview. There'll be a midweek preview. And then there'll be live streams as well. So just pay attention to our Twitter. Uh, pay attention to our YouTube. If you haven't subscribed there already, just go to YouTube, uh, search Fantasy Hockey Podcast, and we will come up. So be sure to subscribe there. Uh, and other than that, uh, consider we'll our Discord as well. Specials. Yeah, and our Discord as Over well. Over 1,300 Fantasy Hockey fans in here now, which is, there's just constant. It's so, <laughs> there's so much. If you want to talk to somebody about Fantasy Hockey, there's, I don't know how many people are there at any given time, but your questions will be answered very quickly. Yeah, virtually everyone gets a response super quick. And you can find all our links to everything on at fantasyhockeypodcast.com. And other than that, thank you so much for listening. We will catch you for the special episodes coming Monday and Tuesday. Yep, thanks for listening.